Well, thank you all for, for coming today. Um, and <clears throat> uh, my intent is to speak for maybe 30 minutes, yeah, and so perfect. leave some time for discussion. And um, I hope you find this interesting. I'm <clears throat> I have become very interested <clears throat> in the question of how secular states accommodate uh, religious minorities. And I'm very concerned about the way in which secularism is being undermined um, by demands for accommodation. And I'm also concerned that <clears throat> secular states are <clears throat> sabotaging their own credibility, our own credibility, um, by the way that we or they promote what's described as secularism but and, and different forms of secularism, and yet from an outsider point of view look like simply a preference for majority uh, Christianity or in particular Catholicism um, in parts of Europe. And that the result is an apparent hypocrisy that undermines the, the credibility of, uh, of the state and, and undermines the credibility of uh, a claim of neutrality. The United States and Italy and France are all uh, secular democracies. Um, <clears throat> and yet, um, what does that mean uh, for members of religious minorities? Uh, are they equally free to practice uh, their religions? Is the state really neutral? Uh, are church and state really separate? Um, <clears throat> I want to look at three, three cases, three high court decisions. Uh, one from the United States, uh, two from the European Court of Human Rights, but in each case affirming uh, decisions from the high courts in France and Italy, uh, respectively. Um, and from these three decisions, um, I think there's one conclusion uh, which is self-evident. And that is that in each of these states, there is a state preference uh, for Christianity um, uh, in Italy and France for Catholicism. And that um, members of other religions, minority rich religions, have good cause to feel unwelcome. And I think that's a problem. Uh, the first of the cases <coughs> is um, town, v. Greece, uh, town of Greece v. Galloway. Uh, it, uh, it began as a dispute in 1999 in the town of Greece, New York, which is a city or town of about 100,000 people uh, adjoining Rochester uh, at the edge of Lake Erie in upstate New York. Uh, and the town board uh, decided to begin their monthly meetings with a prayer. Uh, and so they invited a number of local uh, priests and Christian ministers on a rotating basis to begin each meeting with a prayer. These were always Christian Catholic uh, prayers, sometimes Catholic, sometimes Protestant, but always Christian prayers. Um, <clears throat> and they were addressed to the townspeople who had gathered uh, for the town meeting. Uh, these were folks who'd come to exercise their right of petition, uh, to uh, testify, for example, uh, or seek a uh, zoning variance, to seek a uh, uh, traffic signal, uh, to seek uh, street signs or, or traffic lights. Uh, <clears throat> and in each instance, um, regardless of who the particular priest or minister was, they were asked to stand, to bow their heads, and to join in the <coughs> prayer. Uh, just so it's clear, these were not what are sometimes described as non-denominational universalist prayers. Uh, they were quite explicitly Christian. Uh, and here's one example among many that the, uh, that the court 
um, described in the record of the case, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, it's with a due sense of reverence and awe that we come before you today seeking your blessing. You're a wise God, O Lord, as evidenced in the plan of redemption that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So these are clearly uh, Christian uh, prayers. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court concluded, 5-4, uh, that these prayers are permissible, that they don't violate the constitutional prohibition uh, of a state establishment of religion. Uh, now, if the case were being heard today, uh, the court would tie 4-4 on this question. Uh, and so the lower court decision would be affirmed, uh, but without any precedential value. Um, <clears throat> but that's not what happened. The court's reasoning, <clears throat> the argument before the court was, is this an example of something called legislative prayer? And legislative prayer, which has a long history in the United States and has long been approved of by our courts, is prayer which is directed at members of a legislature, usually in the absence of other members of the public, for the purpose of encouraging them to think about God and to think about often a universalist, non-denominational God, and to take seriously their responsibilities as they go about engaging in their legislative activities. The majority, led by Justice Kennedy, held that this was an example. The prayer that I've listed for you and others like it, of proper legislative prayer. Two members of the court, the, the late Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas, concurred but added that in their view, the First Amendment to the United States Constitution does not in any case address the question of legislative prayer, because it only prohibits Congress, not the states, from adopting a national religion. So they said if New York wants to adopt Catholicism as its state religion, or if the town of Greece wants to adopt um, Anglicism or Episcopalianism or, uh, ba or, or the Baptist Church or whatever as their town religion, that that's consistent with American secularism is set forth in the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. That's a minority view, um, but again, two members of, of this five-member majority took that position. The dissenters argued <coughs> that legislative prayer is permissible, but that these prayers didn't meet the criteria for legislative prayer that they were too much directed toward the general public rather than members of the legislative body, and that they were not non-denominational, nor were they non-proselytizing. And under those circumstances, the four dissenters said, this was not a proper example of legislative prayer. But just so it's clear, all nine members of the court agreed that a legislative body in the United States may begin its session with a prayer, to which I've added mon Dieu. Um, <clears throat> this would be unthinkable in France, another secular state, and one that I'll get to in a few minutes. It represents a different kind of secularism than the secularism of laicite. Uh, but again, I'll turn to France in a moment. Um, but just so we're clear first on the United States and where we stand, that <clears throat> I think, and the dissenters pointed out, that there's a significant impact from this decision on Jews, Muslims, Hindus, <coughs> Baha'i, um, other members of minority religions who are well represented in the town of Greece, uh, in that to come before the town board and petition for a zoning ordinance, or as, excuse me, a zoning variance, or a traffic light, or a stop sign, or street lighting, uh, they have to either join in prayer that may offend their own religious beliefs, or they have to conspicuously reject 
joining in that prayer, or they have to conspicuously show up late, which may be regarded as rude, by the people whom they are now going to be asking for this uh, act to be done on their behalf, um, with, I think, potentially damaging uh, consequences. So they are put at a real disadvantage, uh, or they are uh, coerced into participating in a prayer uh, that, they, that may offend deeply uh, their own beliefs. So meanwhile in Italy, let's talk about the second of these three cases, and that's the Lao Tzu case. Um, and the Lao Tzu case is concerned with an Italian law that, that goes back um, quite a ways before, before Italian um, secularism, before the separation of church and state in Italy, uh, but continuing under the uh, agreement uh, that separated the Catholic Church from the Italian state um, and that uh, and the Constitution that Italy adopted which is a secular constitution uh, and that is a law that requires that in every state school classroom in every public school classroom using public school in the American sense not in the English sense there must be displayed a crucifix uh, and just so it's clear not a, not a cross but, uh, but the full crucifix. Um, <clears throat> and so that, <clears throat> that law was challenged by uh, an atheist parent uh, asserting uh, that it uh, stigmatized uh, her child and interfered with her family life and her right to not believe. Um, and uh, the Italian courts upheld the practice uh, and they said that, uh, they said two things. Uh, one, that the crucifix is not a religious symbol. It's a cultural symbol. And two, that it is a symbol of Italian la cité, of Italian secularism. Um, <clears throat> how do you get there? How do you get from the crucifix to it's a symbol of secularism? I actually think it's a brilliant legal argument. It goes something like this, although I'm probably not going to give it full justice. Um, <clears throat> the message of Christianity, the message of Catholicism, is that Christ died in order to give to the world a message of love and brotherhood and sisterhood and tolerance for all. And at the heart of secularism is a respect for all persons regardless of their beliefs, regardless of their religion. Secularism is only made possible in Italy and throughout Europe by Europeans' embrace of Christianity and Christian values. And so the cross and in particular the crucifix becomes a symbol of Christ's love and in that way a symbol of the secularism made possible by Christianity and by Catholicism. That's roughly the, the argument as it was laid out and accepted in the court. Um, uh, by a brilliant legal argument by a scholar then at NYU and now president of the European University Institute in, uh, in Firenze. So, um, <clears throat> the <clears throat> European Court of Human Rights agreed somewhat. They said the crucifix is a religious symbol, but it's also a cultural symbol. And there is no uniform practice across, uh, across Europe uh, there's no European consensus on whether it's appropriate to have a crucifix in the classroom. There are cases that go both ways. There are states that go both ways. Um, and under those circumstances, <clears throat> it's within Italy's um, right under <clears throat> European human rights law to continue this practice. Uh, what's the impact? again on, on Muslims, Hindus, Jews, members of other minority religions uh, if they want to send their children to a state school um, 
they will send their children to a state school in which the crucifix is displayed in the classroom and uh, which they may find offensive and they may find difficult in terms of explaining to their children uh, the conflict between the display of the crucifix and their own religious values, uh, but that's the price they pay for living in a secular uh, society. Um, let me go on to the French case um, and then try to wrap this up. Uh, in terms of why I see this as problematic. Um, and we're at 15 minutes, good. We're, we're doing fine in terms of time. So the third case <clears throat> is <clears throat> SAS uh, versus France, SAS being the initials of a French uh, woman, a citizen um, of France, and a Muslim who chose not to identify herself by her full name. Uh, and the story really begins in 2009 uh, when the French National Assembly formed a commission to study the increasing use of the full face veil in France. Now the French, uh, the, the, the face covering most commonly used in France is properly described as the niqab, um, although I may have mispronounced it. Uh, but the French referred to it generally as the burqa and the law that ultimately emerged was known as the burqa ban. Uh, so burqa is probably not the technically correct term, but <clears throat> it's the term that is <clears throat> more or less universally used um, by the French and now others to describe uh, the law that, uh, <clears throat> that came out of this commission study. <clears throat> the commission reported back in 2010 uh, that nearly 2,000 women in France a country of about 60 million people, uh, covered their faces in order to comply with their understanding of Islamic law. Uh, Islamic law on this question is uh, contested, uh, but um, this was their understanding. And they recommended, the, the study recommended policies to encourage women <clears throat> not to cover their faces and to protect women who were forced to cover. <clears throat> Uh, there was concern that there were women who were covering their faces in public because the, uh, their fathers or brothers or other members of their family or community were um, coercing them to do so. Um, the <clears throat> report did not recommend uh, a legal ban on face covering in public, uh, and human rights groups uh, agreed uh, that the ban on face covering would be impermissible under French law. But the Prime Minister asked the Conseil d'État, the, the Council of the State, which serves the functions of a Supreme Court of Administrative Law, uh, for an advisory opinion on the legality of a law that would ban all face covering. And the Conseil d'État issued an opinion that said that a ban on all face covering would likely be unconstitutional, uh, but that a more limited ban would be proper to protect women from being forced to cover. Uh, that is one of the concerns that was raised, and also for security purposes. Uh, there are times at which it may be necessary to ask someone to reveal their face um, in order to um, identify someone for security reasons. So the Conseil d'État said a more limited law would be permissible. The French Parliament uh, uh, later that year uh, passed a, uh, a ban on face covering and it was a ban on all face covering. It did not restrict itself to these two uh, instances or, or problems. Um, it did address uh, the question of security it did address the question of coercion. Um, it instituted particularly, uh, instituted more serious sanctions uh, for people who would force someone uh, to cover uh, her face uh, for religious purposes. Um, uh, but it banned any face covering in public um, although, as we'll see, there were some exceptions, uh, uh, not initially, but in the law as um, <clears throat> reinterpreted and, and now enforced. There were six justifications offered uh, by the uh, French Parliament. 
Um, uh, the first was a that the veil, uh, as it was described, um, is a rejection of the values of the French Republic. Uh, that it interferes with the fundamental requirements of uh, of living together as citizens, la vie ensemble. Uh, that it interferes with civility in social interaction. That a person wearing the veil denies dignity to others by asserting that they pose a danger that the veil wearer must guard against or must be protected against. Uh, that the veil is a manifestation of the denial of equality between men and women. And finally, that covering one's face could endanger public safety. So all, just, all of those justifications were offered uh, by the government, by the prime minister, uh, and the parliament in response uh, overwhelmingly um, <clears throat> passed uh, the, the, uh, the Burqa ban. Uh, the, the numbers, uh, have I got the right slide? Yeah. <clears throat> numbers were overwhelming, and at that point it went, as, uh, as sometimes occurs, um, <clears throat> under French law, uh, to the Constitutional Council, um, <clears throat> which has responsibility for another part of what we would put into one Supreme Court in the U.S., and it has the responsibility for determining before a law takes effect or sometimes afterward, depending on how the challenge occurs, um, whether this is in compliance with the French Constitution, the Conseil Constitutionnel approved the law, um, and it was then the responsibility of the government to uh, put it into effect. So in 2011, the, uh, the government uh, provided certain exceptions in putting the law into effect, exceptions for coverings worn in the context of sports, festivities, or artistic or traditional events. So, um, what does that mean? What are, hi, come and join us. Um, <clears throat> what are festivities or uh, artistic or traditional events uh, which would be exempt from the law uh, requiring face covering? Um, uh, three examples for you. Uh, Carnival, uh, and uh, here's some uh, pictures from, uh, from Air France. Uh, advertising come come to Nice for Carnival okay uh, these folks have their faces covered but that's not a violation of the Burqa ban um, religious ceremonies that are Catholic or Christian this is this is not the Ku Klux Klan this is Holy Thursday in the southwest of France um, and it is common uh, on Holy Thursday for a steep street pre um, processions um, have I got, oh, let's see, there's the other one. Um, <clears throat> for a uh, street procession to include um, either monks or other persons who are particularly devout as Catholics to walk through the streets with their faces covered in this way. Um, and finally, uh, <clears throat> wedding veils. Uh, wedding veils, of course, you know, it's common in France to uh, have... Um, a public, it's required to have a public civil marriage and then optional to also have a religious marriage and um, I'm told it's not unusual in the civil marriage which will occur at the mairie, at the city hall for the town or, or district uh, to nonetheless cover one's face even though it's not a religious ceremony. Uh, so those are exempted from the, the burqa ban. Um, <clears throat> On the day the law takes effect, in 2011, SAS files an application with the European Court of Human Rights. And she says, I am a citizen of France, I am a devout Muslim, I am a law student. And without coercion, <clears throat> I cover my face at times, but I don't object <clears throat> to uncovering my face for security purposes. I have not been coerced, and <clears throat> if I am prohibited 
from covering my face in public, I will not be able to pursue my chosen profession. And my understanding is that she has, at least on a temporary basis, emigrated to the United Kingdom <coughs> uh, once finishing her law degree uh, where she can practice law um, because she can't in France. Um, and there was a big to-do when she uh, was unable to attend the uh, hearing in Strasbourg um, in which the court heard her case uh, because it would have meant going out in public uh, with her face covered. <coughs> The um, <clears throat> European Court of Human Rights upheld the French law uh, by 15 votes to two. Uh, that is, there were two dissenting, uh, two dissenting votes, uh, something which in European law is a new thing, um, dissenting opinions. Um, <clears throat> and um, they said basically two things. They said, one, <clears throat> The law is justified. Of the six justifications that were offered, they rejected five. But they said this law is justified by the French value of la vie ensemble, by the importance of living together, and that by wearing the face covering, the <clears throat> plaintiff here removes herself from the ability of others to interact with her. And that violates an important French cultural norm. And second, they said, it's also justified for security purposes, although they note that here, because the plaintiff in this case is willing to uncover her face for security purposes, uh, that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't actually apply here. Oh, and then they say, that's right, <clears throat> it only affects a small minority. This only affects under 2,000 people. And this is where I have to say, um, and I've, I've, I have friends on that court, and I think they're very good people and smart people, and they have good values. And how did they ever get to this, this idea that if you have a very small minority, it's okay to have laws that are directed at them and that in some way make their lives more difficult and separate them from the rest of society, they, under most understandings of both civil rights law in the U.S. and human rights law around the world, are the people who we are particularly concerned about protecting because they're a small minority with no effective voice in the democratic process. So this is, an, and I think this is a, a departure from European human rights law, which I hope doesn't become precedent. Uh, the idea that if you have a very small minority, then it's okay to have laws that are oppressive toward them because it's only a few people being affected. So what about this idea of living together? the critical right to engage with others, to require them to engage with us. And um, I'd like you to look, this is a photo of the former First Lady of France. Um, <clears throat> covering her face with these large sunglasses and of course wearing this conspicuous cross, as she has a right to do in public. Um, <clears throat> she couldn't go into a, into a school uh, wearing that cross, although they might make an exception if she was showing up as the First Lady, I'm not sure. Um, but um, I'm trying to imagine that I have a right to approach her, or for that matter, anyone. Uh, someone whose head is buried in a book, uh, sitting on the metro, and say, I want to engage with you. Please put down your book. <laughs> Remove your sunglasses. I'd like to talk with you. Um, I don't think I, I, that's, that's what it means, I think, to have a right of, of le vivre ensemble, to, to live together. Um, but I'm not sure it's an enforceable right, um, at least in, in the context in which others have a right to say of someone who, who prefers privacy, no, no, you can't have your privacy because I want to engage with you. Um, what's the impact of this decision um, for SAS and others? Uh, again, she has to leave France in order to pursue her profession.
uh, as an advocate. Um, so, three leading constitutional democracies in which secularism is embedded in their constitution um, and which in each instance non-Christians or in France and Italy non-Catholics are reminded by the state of their outsider status and required to engage in behavior that offends their religious beliefs even when those beliefs and practices don't interfere with the legal rights of others. Um, I'm worried about the way that we in the West, in the United States, in Western Europe, in embracing this view of secularism are creating or exacerbating the problem of outsider status among religious minorities. And I'm particularly concerned about the impact that it has on the Muslim minority, um, again, both here in the United States and in Europe, in terms of ex exacerbating the sense of being outsiders.